So, uh, welcome to this lecture on uh, task and motion planning. Maybe uh, let me just say a few words to introduce you, Fabia. Oh, yeah. And then the, the floor will, will be yours. So, okay. um, yeah, welcome to this uh, third day of the, uh, uh, of the summer school. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had two lectures that referred to the topic of uh, combining motion and manipulation planning, which take place in the metric space together with task planning, which is uh, on a symbolic and uh, discrete uh, space. And the techniques for doing this combination are covered in the, uh, the lectures that we'll start right now by Fabien Lagrifoul. Uh, Fabien uh, is a researcher at the Multi-Robot Planning and Control Lab at Orbro University in Sweden. Uh, he defended his PhD five years ago on this uh, on these uh, specific topics on how to combine with several different techniques, task and motion planning. He has been very active and uh, developed a few approaches for this combination of task and motion and motion manipulation planning. And he implemented and experimented this approach on a few robots, on robot manipulators as well as on humanoid. Uh, to arms robotic systems. So thank you, Fabien, for contributing to the summer school. The, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> okay, so I will uh, uh, follow the, the following outline today. I will start, start first with uh, trying to define a bit more precisely the, the problem we are talking about. Uh, then I will address the, the specifics of these problems that uh, makes it uh, difficult. Then I will go uh, on describing um, three different approaches to, to solve task and motion planning. And I will quickly talk uh, to conclude about uh, possible future directions uh, in that field. So first, uh, problem definition. I would like to start with a very general uh, definition, which is that task and motion planning is the, the task of computing uh, given a, a symbolic goal description, a sequence of symbolic actions and motion path for one or several robots that will achieve that goal. <clears throat> so we could think of a typical example, um, a manipulation problem where you have a a robot in front of a table with a number of objects and uh, you want to uh, this robot to reach a certain goals a certain goal that you define symbolically like to have uh, uh, the two cups inside the box but you don't want to go on giving the details of which arm should be used and which motion should be should be performed so in that case there are a number of uh, of decision that needs to be planned for. And uh, the first of these decision is which arm to use and maybe which obstacle uh, to move in order to, to achieve the task. So here, for instance, the robot was moving a, a milk uh, box so that it can reach the cup. Then, uh, of course, you need to, in this case, to make a specific manipulation, which is a regrasp in order to be able to reach the box. And finally, to put the last cup, uh, here you don't need to move uh, obstacles, but you still need to choose the right arm. And you also need to uh, choose the right position for the cups in the bottom of the box so that both cups will be fitting inside the box. So there is a number of, of decisions here that, uh, that have to be made, both uh, at the symbolic level and uh, geometric level, in order to to reach the, the symbolic goal. So how do we do that? Well, we, we use uh, techniques from, uh, from both fields, the task planning and the motion planning. And uh, since we are at the ICAPS conference, I will, um, I will more insist on the, on the motion planning part because I assume the audience know most of the techniques of that book. <clears throat> so, in motion planning, uh, an important concept is the, the configuration space. So in motion planning, uh, we use the concept of configuration 
uh, so configuration is a, is a real vector that that describes the actual position uh, of a robotic system. Uh, each component of this vector can be a, an angular value or a, a translation value in the in the workspace. Of course, um, the configuration can describe the, the configuration of many different types of robots uh, with different numbers of degrees of freedom. And it can both refer to the, yeah, the angular values, translation, and the, the common thing of all these uh, representations is that one configuration of a robot can be described as a point uh, in the configuration space. So for instance, uh, this dummy robot here would have a configuration Q and another configuration of, of the robot in another place with another position of the arm could be described by a, a position Q, Q prime. Um, then of course you can move uh, in this space. So in the, in the workspace, the, the robot could move and move its arm. And we would have, of course, uh, a path in the in the configuration space. Uh, it's not that simple to do motion planning, so it's not just about making linear interpolation between configurations, because in the workspace you usually have obstacles, and these obstacles they have a representation also in the in the configuration space. So we defined within the configuration space, a subspace, which we call C obstacles, which is the set of configurations where the robot is colliding with an object. And uh, we have the, the complement, uh, the white part here, which is the free uh, configuration space. So the set of configurations where the robot can move without colliding any obstacle. And therefore finding a, a motion path is simply to, to find a, a path in the configuration space, which uh, is only inside the free configuration space. Um, we formally defined a, a motion path as a, as a function or a mapping. Uh, so what, what it basically means here is that uh, it's a, a segment uh, within the, the configuration, the free configuration space. Um, there are cases where um, there is no motion path, so the initial configuration and the final configuration belong to uh, two disconnected, as we call them, components in the configuration space. I mentioned this because this is important for the uh, task and motion planning problem. So just to give a, a visual illustration of the of the configuration space we have here on the left side uh, a two link robot so the configuration is defined by two angular values and on the right side you have the the corresponding point uh, in the configuration space now i will show you the same picture but with uh, obstacles so on the left side you have the obstacles uh, in the workspace. And on the right side, you have the obstacles in the configuration space. So usually obstacles appear in this sort of very uh, weird shapes. And that's why the motion planning uh, problem is difficult because you need to find a path uh, in this space. <clears throat> so how do we solve uh, this problem in, uh, in practice? Well, we uh, usually uh, use sampling based algorithm because there are no uh, exact algorithms or there are, but for very simple uh, planning, motion planning problems. So I will introduce here two uh, very common methods. The first one is a, a probabil probabilistic roadmaps. So it's an algorithm in which uh, first you try to build a map of your configuration space, of your free configuration space. And uh, you spend quite some time building um, a complete map. And then you use this map to, to query it and in order to, to answer uh, several motion planning queries. So you, you use the map that you have pre-processed and given an initial and a goal configuration, you connect 
those configurations to the existing map and you use a graph search algorithm to, to find a path. Uh, this approach only works if your uh, obstacles do not change position. So we usually use another algorithm which is called uh, RRT, Rapidly Exploring Random Trees, to um, solve problems where your, your configuration, uh, where your obstacles change uh, configuration. So it's, it's a bit similar. So it's a sampling algorithm that uh, very quickly and very efficiently cover the, the configuration space. And uh, as soon as you reach your, your goal configuration, you, you just trace back to your initial configuration and, and you have a path. So the, the common feature of these algorithms is that they are not uh, strictly speaking complete. They are only um, probabilistically complete which means that they will find a solution if there exists one, if you let them run long enough, if you have uh, enough uh, sample uh, configurations. And the converse or the, the drawback of this algorithm is that if uh, there is no solution, so if a motion path doesn't exist, meaning that your initial and your goal configuration are in two uh, disconnected components, uh, then you, you cannot you cannot prove it uh, unless you you let the algorithm run forever. So that, that means that in practice we we need to put a, a cut of time on the on the motion planning algorithms. <clears throat> okay, so as I just said before, formally you can you can define the motion planning uh, problem as uh, finding a path. The path being defined as a as a segment in the free configuration space. Um, then task planning. Uh, I will just mention here quickly the uh, the definition based on the a state transition system, where you have a state of state, a state of actions, a tra state transition function, start and goal states. Uh, in order to uh, to define task and motion planning, we will need something something else, uh, which we call uh, mapping functions, uh, which I define here by phi and xi, xi I suppose. Uh, phi is a, is a function that map uh, states, so symbolic states, to geometric configurations. So, for instance, when you say uh, the cup is on the table. Uh, geometrically that represents uh, an infinite set of geometric configuration of the cup being on the table with different position different orientations and so on and we have a similar mapping function for uh, actions where you basically say how you map a symbolic action to a, to a geometric action uh, I may refer later to this uh, mapping function phi as the, the space of grasps and, and placements. So in task and motion planning, unfortunately, we, we haven't reached the, the level of standardization that uh, you guys in, in task planning have. We don't have a, a clear standards. Uh, however, me and some other authors, we have tried to, to bring a bit of, of standards here and Basically, we, we try to define uh, this uh, space of grasp and placement, how we, we could represent it using a, a XML based language. And, and basically, we need to define uh, certain things like SSPs, so surfaces supporting stable placements. So that will tell to the, to the system, to the planner, planning system, when you place an object, where you can place it and uh, how you can place it. Similarly, uh, SOPs, so stable object poses. So when you put an object somewhere, you, you cannot just put it in the air. You, the object has to be in a stable position. So a cup, for instance, can be in its natural position or it can be upside down, or maybe it can lie uh, on the side. I mean, these things have to be defined in order to know 
uh, in, in which space you are you are searching. <clears throat> but once you have defined these two mapping functions, then you can uh, define the task and motion planning problem uh, very very simply. Uh, a graphical illustration here would be that you you have of course an initial state and an initial configuration. Then you need to find a plan which will reach the symbolic goal. And for each of the actions, there is a, a motion path, so a trajectory in the free configuration space. And additionally, uh, there is a constraint here that uh, at, the, at the end of, of, I mean, a continuity constraint between the, the end of an action and the beginning of the next action. We will also assume uh, for the for the rest of the of this talk that uh, we are in a case where the world is fully observable and the actions are, are, are deterministic. So all the objects are known, uh, identified, and localized in space. And when you the only agent that can change the state of object is the is the robot or the robots. Uh, I would like to mention a uh, couple of related problems, um, sub-problems, so special instance of task and motion planning, which are uh, manipulation planning, uh, so a problem in which you uh, try to move objects uh, by multiple uh, grasp and regrasp actions. Uh, NAMO, uh, which is navigation among movable obstacles. So in this problem, you, the goal is to move the, the robot from one location to another, but with a lot of obstacles that you need to move away in order to make your path. Then you have also rearrangement planning, where the problem is to uh, rearrange objects, uh, usually in a, in a limited space. So you have to carefully plan for uh, where to place objects in intermediate poses. And finally, uh, I will mention multimodal motion planning, which is usually uh, motion planning for uh, robots which have a large uh, number of degrees of freedom. And then you, you kind of split the configuration space into subspaces, uh, which we call modes. And, and you try to find a transition between this, these modes. So what is common to all these problems is that they have a, a motion planning uh, aspect uh, to, to, to find motion path for these robots, but you also have a, a discrete structure on top of it, which you can usually take advantage of uh, in order to solve your motion planning problem. <clears throat> okay, so after the definition, I, I would like to see a bit more in detail what makes motion planning, task and motion planning uh, difficult. I, I will address three different points. Um, started with the coupling or the, I would say the necessary coupling between the, the symbolic search space and the, and the geometric search space. I will start with a, a simple example here where we want to to place the bottle in the box. And we have a sort of obstacle here, which is above the, the object. Uh, we will assume here a, a naive approach. So where we don't uh, couple, we don't interleave uh, task planning and motion planning. We say, okay, we do the task planning first. And once we have a, a symbolic plan, we will try to find the, the motion path corresponding to each action. So if you do that, uh, well, you, you may get a plan, a symbolic plan, like for instance, pick the bottle with the right hand and place the bottle in the box. Unfortunately, this plan is not uh, feasible because you cannot even uh, reach the bottle with the right arm. So you keep doing symbolic planning and you may get a second plan where this time you use the left arm. Uh, but here the problem is that you cannot reach the box so you can reach the bottle with the left arm, but you cannot reach the box with the left arm. And eventually you will find a, a plan that may work, 
which is to pick the bottle with the left arm, place it somewhere in the middle of the table, regrasp it with the right arm, and then place it in the in the box. So this uh, simple example is just here to show that uh, this approach, this naive approach of separating both planning uh, processes is not, is not realistic for larger problem. Because in, in, in this example, we, we reached um, a feasible plan after discarding a few others, but you can easily imagine that on a larger problem, the chance imagine a plan with 10 or 20 actions, the chance that all these 20 actions are geometrically feasible is very low. So you would basically move back and forth between task and motion planning into um, uh, yeah, thousands of hundreds of thousands of plans. So we need a, a better approach, a, a more precise approach. Uh, so the, the first idea which, which comes to mind here is to uh, do uh, motion planning or at least some sort of feasibility check of your symbolic actions while you are uh, while you are uh, doing your task planning. So for instance here we could have checked when trying to to apply the pick uh, object with the right arm we could have checked if this action is feasible and then we would realize that it's not and therefore we could uh, immediately prune half of the search space. And the same would go uh, for this action here. So placing uh, with the left arm is not feasible. And this would have give us a, a solution more quickly. So it's usually uh, a good thing to, to interleave uh, symbolic and geometric search because it allows you to, to prune your, your search space quite quite heavily. But uh, the drawback of this is that this checking feasibility has a cost. Uh, and this cost is maybe not very high, but on large problems, it becomes uh, significant. So these feasibility checks are the, the following. Uh, the first check is uh, inverse kinematics. So inverse kinematics is a check that you can do very quickly. Uh, it's just to check that there exists uh, a target configuration for your action. So for instance, if you want to reach a certain point in space, uh, you know where you want to place the, the gripper of the robot, but you need to compute a configuration for the, for the arm. <clears throat> so there are generally uh, several solutions to, uh, to that problem. But this is something you should do first before doing motion planning. Uh, then you should check that this uh, configuration is not uh, in collision with any obstacle. And only when these two conditions have been reached, then you can call your, your motion planner. So if inverse kinematics fails, you don't need to do the, the following tests. So depending on the problem, you may uh, have to do one or several of these tests. But overall, uh, when you interleave task and motion planning, you have to, to account for this uh, feasibility checkings, which on large problems will take a lot of time. <clears throat> um, okay, so this coupling between uh, symbolic and, and geometric reasoning is one thing that makes task and motion planning difficult. Another thing, is geometric backtracking. So here, backtracking is, is uh, not maybe the right one because it, it contains the idea of, of um, chronological order. But more generally, uh, I will call by geometric backtracking, I will refer to the process of reconsidering uh, choices at the geometric level. A very good example of this is uh, well, when you, you are carrying your, uh, your files, your laptop and your, your cup of coffee and you want to get back to your office and when you are looking for your key, uh, you realize that it's in the wrong pocket. So this is a, a typical example where you need to plan in advance uh, at the geometric level in order to not end up in, uh, 
in, in this situation. And this uh, happens more often than we think. So in the example that I gave in the beginning, for instance, uh, when you place, uh, when the robot places the first cup here in the box, he should not place it in the middle of the box because then when you will try to place the second cup, this will fail. So uh, here you need at planning time to uh, make the right choices in order to, to avoid to end up in a, in a dead end. I, I take a more detailed example of this uh, geometric backtracking process on the, on the, on the example we, we took. So here uh, we will start from the plan where that we, we find earlier that the, the robot will place the bottle in an intermediate pose before putting it in the box. And in this particular case, you need to first uh, find a, a grasp, a, a good grasp of the bottle, and then uh, move it somewhere on the table. And this requires to sample a couple of positions. And then you will try to, from that position, to keep it with the right pick it with the right hand. And in that case, this is not feasible. So it's, it's not clear here on the picture why it's not feasible, but it's because uh, simply there is not inverse kinematic solution uh, to grasp the bottle. That's something uh, which is not obvious maybe for people which are not working with robot, but it's not because an object is uh, very close to the robot that it's easily reachable uh, because of the, the kinematic constraint, the geometric constraint of the, of the robotic arm, it, it's highly possible that uh, you cannot reach a certain point in space simply because the, the joint of the, of the arm will not allow for it. So in that case, we will have to backtrack and, and try to find another placement for the, for the bottom. So we will sample a couple of other configurations try again to pick it with the right hand. But here again, we have a problem of finding a position for the bottle. So you can see here on the picture that the arm is colliding. So we need to iterate over several positions until no collision exists. Then we try again to pick the bottle with the right arm. And here you see that there is a collision between the thumb and the obstacle. So we need to look to iterate over several inverse kinematic solutions to find one that may work. And in that case, none of them will work because the bottle is too close to the obstacle. So again, we will have to backtrack, try a different grasp and try to move it to yet another position. Here, again, we need to find a non-colliding position for the arm and again, try to pick it, and in that case, uh, the bottle can be picked and placed. So what I wanted to show by this example is that even a simple uh, plan with four actions can uh, require a lot of uh, processing at the geometric level in order to find a feasible plan. In that case, we have visited around 100 configuration, backtrack two times, and call the motion planner a bit more than four times I think so. This is a very heavy uh, procedure. Another uh, thing that makes task and motion planning difficult is more general feature of this problem is that where well, the search space is very large because it's you could see it as the as the cross product of the symbolic search space and the space of grasps and placements. And those two spaces, they, are, they, they, are, they have different metrics. Uh, this is actually a quote from uh, Malik Galab. Uh, the problem is not really that one is discrete and one is continuous, but it's that they are not uh, operating on the same metrics. So you could have uh, two equal symbolic states with very uh, different geometric configurations. So when you say, the symbolic level that the cup is on the table and the robot is in the kitchen. Uh, geometrically, the robot can be anywhere in the kitchen and the cup can be anywhere on the table. And conversely, two different symbolic states may have very similar geometric configuration. For instance, 
when you say that the object is uh, grasped by the robot, and when you say that the robot uh, has placed the object on the table, this could be almost the same configuration. What in, in one case, uh, the fingers are touching the object, and in the second case, the fingers are maybe one centimeter or even one millimeter away from the object. In one case, the object is grasped, and in the former one, in the later one, the object is not grasped. So uh, you cannot simply make uh, some sort of um, combination of symbolic and geometric state, uh, some sort of hybrid state, and, and, and apply uh, type uh, distance to goal type of heuristics. <laughs> there are other difficulties, of course, but these are, in my view, the main ones. So how do we uh, address such a difficult problem? Well, I will mention three uh, different approaches, um, three different philosophies. So I will start with uh, Asimov, uh, which is the planner developed uh, here in uh, LAS. Uh, so Asimov is interesting because uh, it, uh, from, I think it was the, the first one. Uh, and historically, there is a, a clear evolution in the, in the research done by this group that shows uh, how they came up from um, grass planning to um, where they were dealing basically with simple, simplified manipulation uh, planning problem with here you can see discrete, uh, discrete placement and grasps and how their approach has evolved towards uh, manipulation planning. So more complex problem with continuous grasps and placements. And finally, uh, this led to the, uh, the design of Asimov, which is a, a task and motion planner, which, which builds on a, a manipulation planner. Uh, in, in the movie here, you see a, an example scenario of the, Tower of Hanoi uh, problem. So this is uh, essentially a manipulation planning problem, but uh, a manipulation planner is not enough here because you also have this uh, symbolic constraints uh, of the problem, uh, namely that you cannot place a large disk on a smaller disk. And these constraints cannot be handled by a, by a simple manipulation plan. So how does uh, Asimov uh, works? So just the, in the, the big lines, uh, without entering the details, uh, the base is a, is a manipulation planner. So it means a planner which works with, the, with probabilistic roadmaps, but several of them. So roadmaps for the, the robot uh, in transit, meaning the, the robot is moving along without carrying any object. Then you have roadmaps for transfer, where the robot is actually carrying an object and roadmaps for placements, which samples different poses uh, of, the, of the object. And basically, you try to connect these roadmaps in order to, uh, to find a, a manipulation uh, path. Um, but the core of Asimov is in the, this state uh, that they define, a hybrid state, which consists of a symbolic part, so basically a symbolic state, and a geometric part, which is um, a set of uh, geometric configurations which are um, pending for, for validation in the roadmap. So on top of this uh, state, they use uh, an A star search algorithm. And uh, the cost function is uh, defined as the sum of three components. So the accumulated cost or cost to go, uh, and a heuristic cost, and another cost uh, based on the number of failures. So the number of failures here refers to uh, the number of failures when trying to uh, geometrically validate uh, a state in this, in this manipulation planner. While the heuristic cost, and this is actually where the uh, task and motion planning comes in. Uh, this heuristic cost is given by uh, calling the FF planner from the, the current state. 
and it's simply the length of the of the symbolic plan. So uh, the, the the algorithm balance a bit his uh, his front search between uh, between places where it can uh, manipulate object and, and and, and places which are closer to the to the goal state. So this approach uh, allowed to solve uh, uh, quite interesting problems, quite complex problems. Uh, an example here is the the IKEA uh, problem, where you need two robots to to build a table. So one robot is manipulating a, a glue gun and it has to apply the glue on the table, while the other robot will place the foot of the table. And then both robots will uh, together uh, manipulate the, the table to, to flip it in the, in the correct orientation. <clears throat> and there has been other uh, uh, people using similar approach. Uh, I will mention here uh, PlaQ and Al, which uh, use the same ID in the sense that uh, their planner is based on a sampling based motion planner. And they are using uh, also uh, FF as a as a heuristic for where to where to sample uh, in the in the sampling based motion planner. Okay, I will also mention another approach which is uh, interesting. Uh, FF Rob, it's not a planner really, but it's a more a heuristic. So. FFROB uh, builds on uh, is meant to be used with the with a task planner. So how does it work? Is that well, you you define your domain um, as usual. Um, in that case, for manipulation problem, you will have pick and place actions, and uh, there is this uh, specific predicate here, which is reachable reachable uh, and two parameters c1 c2 which correspond to geometric configurations uh, the second uh, element of this uh, heuristic is to use um, a data structure which they call uh, conditional reachability graph which is a bit similar to a to a roadmap uh, but you also have additional information in that graph uh, that will tell you uh, under which circumstances uh, these uh, two nodes, meaning two configurations, are reachable, reachable from one, one, one another. So what this edge here in the graph means is that when you are trying to move from C1 to C2 and holding uh, a certain object with a certain grasp, then you collide or not with uh, an object O located at pose P. Um, so this is a graph which is uh, pre-computed and, and uh, of which the edges are, are validated during planning. Uh, the third component of this approach is to uh, use a modification of the FF heuristic. So the FF heuristic is based on the, on the planning graph and, and in which you, once you have extended your planning graph, then you, you just uh, uh, trace back and count uh, the number, number of action uh, needed to achieve the goal while uh, ignoring negative effects. So FFROB will use this planning graph, but uh, the ID, um, so uh, it's a bit complicated, so without entering the detail, but Roughly, the idea is that uh, in your uh, in your layers, in, in your uh, fact layers, you will of course have this uh, uh, literals uh, reachable with different values for uh, configuration one and configuration two, and you will be able to, uh, to to query your conditional reachability graph uh, to assess those literals, and well, the result of this is that. A state uh, which uh, which has in which the occluding objects uh, in your problem have been moved away, or uh, a 
states that will allow you to more easily move those objects, this state will, will get uh, a better heuristic value. So what this heuristic will do is that it will guide the, the planner towards the, the symbolic goal, but at the same time, uh, it will guide it in, in such a way that the, it will resolve uh, the, the occlusion problems, the reachability problems that you have at the, at the geometric uh, level. So it's, it's kind of an elegant approach. Uh, and this is the work by uh, uh, Garrett and uh, Lozano Perez. It's um, uh, also been used by uh, former colleagues of mine, uh, Ali Akbari, uh, which use a, a similar, yeah, similar approach, a modification of the effect heuristics with, uh, with ge geometric information. Okay, I will now move on to uh, an approach that I have been uh, mostly working on, uh, which is to use uh, ASP and failure explanation. So um, here the idea is we move from um, state-based planning to um, more something like uh, SAT-based planning. So where you, you, you convert your planning problem into a, a CNF solve it and uh, then convert back your model into a, a plan. Well, in that case, I was, I was using ASP solver um, for, for technical reasons and also for the convenience of the, of the language here. But the idea is that you, you go into a, a cycle. So you, you first compute a plan. Uh, then you, you uh, fit this plan into a geometric reasoner. And what the geometric reasoner does here is that it tries to find what, what is wrong in your plan, what is not geometrically feasible in your plan. And, and from, from this result, it will be able to uh, generate um, a logical um, proposition that, that or logical constraint that will be fed back to the to the solver, the solver will include it in its uh, constraint database or rule database, and process it and uh, continue uh, the search until it, it finds another plan. And of course, this uh, other plan will take into account the the constraints that you just gave him. So the the, the key here is, uh, of course, the, the geometric reasoner. So the geometric reasoner in that case is not simply doing motion planning. It's looking for more complicated things. Uh, an example here is, um, uh, for instance, in a, in, a, in a problem where you, let's say the goal here is to place bl the, this block A on top of block B. Um, so imagine a plan where uh, this robot here would come here uh, first, and then uh, the humanoid robot would, would pick and place uh, the block A and place it on block B. We, we can analyze this plan uh, with the geometric reasoner. And by simply looking at bounding box or um, bounding condition on what robots, uh, what the geometric features of the robot allow them to do or not, we can see here, for instance, that the right arm is necessarily contained in that, in that cube here. And when this robot will, will reach this, this location, the block uh, B here will necessarily be in this area here. And since these two areas are not intersecting, well, we we know without even doing motion planning that this plan will not be feasible. And we, we can therefore uh, generate a, a constraint, uh, a logical constraint, and exploit it in the planning process. Um, another example here is, uh, for instance, the blocks world uh, task and motion planning version here, where here there is a, a hidden constraint in the in this setup is that when you will try to solve the problem, you will probably have to move one pile, you will have to build your pile in on the left side or on the right side. So you will have to move some of the blocks 
on the table first and then on the pile. And because of this obstacle here, you will not be able to stack more than two blocks here. So whatever, uh, whatever place you choose on the table, when you will try to stack three blocks, the elbow of the, of the robot will always touch this obstacle here. So <clears throat> um, how, do we, how do we analyze this, this problem? So in the geometric reasoner, we will also use um, sampling techniques. And to summarize, we will remove from the world all the things that can move and only keep the things we are interested in. So here, for instance, we remove all the blocks. We only keep the th three blocks. We even remove the left arm of the robot because it could be a, an obstacle. So somehow we, we relax the problem and we, we really try to uh, put this, uh, this configuration in, in many possible places and we try to, to grasp it. And if all of this grasping action fail, since we did it on a relaxed problem, we know that it will fail for all other uh, configuration where the, the arm is there, when the other blocks are there. And therefore, we will be able to generate a constraint, uh, a logical constraint of, of that type. So we will say to the, to the ASP solder, uh, don't give me any plan where uh, block A is on the table where block I is on block A and where block J is on block I. And this constraint will be fed back to the ASP solver and it will give another plan. What's interesting here is that uh, you can uh, give to the solver constraints which, which are much more efficient uh, in terms of, of pruning of the, of the search space. So <clears throat> you could, for instance, say, that since block A, all the blocks are at the same geometry, you could return a constraint of that type uh, using a variable. So you could say uh, not on x, y, and on y, z, and on z table when x, y, and z are of type block. And this will basically uh, prune out from your, uh, your symbolic search space all the plans that contain at some point or another, uh, a combination of three blocks on the table. So it, it's it's a quite a powerful uh, pruning technique. Uh, so uh, this uh, algorithm allows to basically here the example I'm showing is a bit the the limits uh, that uh, the algorithm reach uh, because here you have like ten blocks, uh, I think fifty action uh, and. Uh, this requires around 10 minutes uh, of computation. So this is uh, this was the third type of approach uh, by uh, me and uh, Benjamin Andres. There are other people using uh, ASP also for, for task and motion planning. Uh, they are in, in the bibliography. Uh, okay, so that was three different approaches, uh, three different philosophies, uh, because Asimov is, um, is a task planner, which is used as a heuristic for a motion planner, let's say. In FFROB, it's a bit the opposite. It's a, it's a task planner, and the heuristic is a, is a manipulation planner or a roadmap sort of structure. So two, two, two opposite or yeah, you could say different opposite philosophies. And in the third example, it's yet another uh, philosophy that um, geometric reasoner is pruning the search space uh, of the task plan. There are of course other approaches, but I wanted to, to bring in those three because they are very different from, uh, from each other. Uh, all right, so after this, I will uh, move to future uh, direction, but I shall be honest here. Uh, I'm uh, a bit doing uh, different things uh, since uh, 
the last year, one and two years. So I'm not completely up to date with the, the recent work uh, in task and motion planning. Uh, however, I will uh, I will mention that I have seen a couple of uh, works going in the direction of learning. Um, from what I have seen, it's more using uh, learning to uh, to speed up the the geometric uh, aspects of task and motion planning. So you you learn which part of the configuration space are, are a bit tricky from previous uh, planning results. And, and when you see similar configurations, you, you know a bit that this is a place where you, you should not go. Um, because by learning, um, we may think of other types of learning. So for instance, in the, in the project uh, where I was uh, working for my PhD, one of the goal of the projects was to learn um, symbolic operators uh, given execution traces of, um, of, of different tasks. So the input would be like the motions of the robot and the, the position of the objects moving around. And then the goal was to learn which operators uh, and which preconditions uh, for these operators uh, the robot is using. And that's actually uh, quite difficult, I think, although that would be interesting to, to manage. But the problem is that it's very difficult from execution traces uh, to determine exactly when an action starts and when an action stops. Um, uh, for instance, you could think of a, a peak action uh, do I stop once I have completely grasped the object or do I consider that I have to grasp the object and lift, lift it uh, over the table, then it's grasped. Um, there are, it's very difficult to, to learn operators uh, without uh, a minimum of uh, human labeling uh, on the execution traces. But, Still, I, I've seen that there is a, a direction taken towards learning, including more learning in task and motion planning. Uh, very recently, uh, there was this article by uh, Vega Brown about uh, task and motion planning is P space complete. So there is a, a demonstration of complexity here. That's maybe something uh, interesting to see the how the demonstration is done and if there is something to that can be exploited in, in, in practical terms. Um, and well, if if I would uh, continue research in, in that direction, I think I would uh, continue on um, this idea of uh, failure explanation, uh, culprit detection, uh, because I think that this is one of the key uh, in the task and motion planning problem is to to clearly identify what makes uh, the geometric level fail and sometimes the, the reason why it fails it's it's more than just an object which is not reachable it's, it's a combination of different things and i think it's it's very important to try to to identify this clearly and inform uh, the the symbolic level also in details of what is going wrong so that it can guide its search more precisely and finally, uh, I, I wanted a, a bit as a joke to, to say that uh, uh, future direction is maybe you guys, because uh, I think the, uh, the, the task planning community is very, uh, is very smart and comes up with very bright ideas, very bright uh, heuristics. Actually, most of the, the work that has been done in task and motion planning is, is based on, on your work. And I, I'm quite sure that uh, there are still uh, a number of things that, uh, that, that can be taken from, the, from that field. I don't know, I've never seen anything about plan space planning, for instance, or maybe using landmarks also. Or, I mean, there are a number of ideas which are, I think here um, robotic uh, people are not aware of. And that can be uh, that can be exploited for uh, for doing task and motion planning. 
and that will be the my conclusion uh, thank you very much All right. thank you very much fabian uh, we, we have time for for questions and uh, discussion you already have several questions on the on the chat oh yeah sorry so if we can look at them and uh, uh, for the students who have asked questions, they can unmute themselves. And in particular, the first, two, the, the three first questions are from Shabam. If you would like to rephrase them, please go ahead. Is the assumption of continuity with respect to motion of objects? Uh, uh, it's both the, the continuity for objects and for the, the robots. If I understand correctly the question. Um, well, there should be not, there should not be any, uh, any uh, teleportation of the robot in between action, of course. So I would say the continuity is, is for everything. Um, when the backtracking is happening to find the correct position of the bottle on the table, the arm orientation is being searched too, yes. It seems in every attempt of backtracking, same failed arm convention are being searched again. Yeah, I see. Um, uh, so, the, the, yeah, you you will you will search for the you will see the same position of arm again, but the difference is that the bottle is uh, is oriented differently in the gripper, <clears throat> so it's not exactly the same configuration. In, in the case of the bottle, it doesn't really matter because it's it's a symmetrical by rotation but you could you could think of other objects which are not symmetrical and and then the way you you grasped it in the previous action that that would be important uh, can we use a hierarchical task planning here on the subtask of arm orientation during bottle placement on the table uh, i don't know i I'm not sure to uh, any idea, Malik, on that question. Well, maybe we can ask uh, Shubham to rephrase it. Yeah. Uh, then I guess this is taken care of uh, through constraint in your ASP plus failure approach. Um, uh, so this, by this, you refer to uh, the multiple configuration or Okay, in, in the ASP plus failure approach, um, I mean, the details of which uh, arm, which configuration the arm is in, I mean, these details are completely, the, uh, the ASP solver is completely blind to them. I mean, this is only dealt with in the geometric reasoner. Parisa, is that possible to explain about this relaxation? If the problem is complex, how do you decide how to uh, how and what to extend relax? Yeah, um, so I guess you are you are talking about the the relaxation uh, here. Um, yeah, how do I decide? Yeah, why do I decide to keep only a a i and j? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, actually, it's because, um, I mean, the, the best is to read the paper, but there is a previous step in this geometric reasoning where you first reason on bounding boxes. And, and, and from this step, you can establish um, links. You can see that when you, you built a pile of object, the, the position of the last object is determined by the position of the first object, but not determined by the position of objects which are around. Because it's, it's just constraints, it's just relations between variables. So it's from these constraints that I can decide uh, in, this, in this case to only keep the blocks A, I, and J. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and yeah, and 
for the, the rest, I mean, the, I remove, I keep, of course, all the fixed obstacles. So the table never moves uh, in this setup. The, the torso of the robot never moves. The obstacle, which is floating uh, over, never moves. So those things, they, they have to stay in the scene. <clears throat> and so from this, if I can never stack J on I with this very relaxed problem, then I know that I will never be able to do it in any other more complex situation. So I can, from one in instance, I can prune out a lot of other cases. Uh, is the last approach, ASP pruning only, happens after a full plan is found and then tested for feasibility? Wouldn't it be full catch invisible combinations earlier? Uh, so yes, in this approach, we, we, we start from a full plan. Uh, well, to catch it earlier, it's a bit complicated because the, the search space of the, of the ASP solver uh, is not really a state space uh, as in state space planning. So uh, you, you are just, uh, you are just uh, working with the true false value of, of, of different propositions. And there is not such thing as a, as a state on which you can stop, you, you cannot stop the, the solver and say, okay, we are in that state. So it, it's, um, it's not possible to, to do the early, early pruning like, like we do with a, a state space planner. Um, how much ad hoc work for each problem is needed in the geometric reasoner? Um, well, the, 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 the geometric reasoner has been developed, uh, of course, each time I was uh, facing a new problem, I would, I would uh, add a, a new, I would handle that case in, in the geometric reasoner, but you can, you can still come up with generic uh, types of problems. So you have, uh, you have, uh, first of all, reachability problems. So basically uh, the gripper cannot reach a certain position. Then you have collision problems. So you know that, uh, for instance, like in this example where you know that as long as you have three blocks on, on top of each other, there will always be a co collision between the elbow and the, and the, um, and the obstacle. And so these, these things are generic. They would work for any, for the block world problem, but also for a Tower of Hanoi type of problem. And I mean, this reachability and collision problems, they are always there. Um, and then there is a, another uh, level of, of failure uh, analysis that you can do is when you have um, combination, so combination of, act of actions which, which never work. So basically what you can do is you take your, your plan and you will try um, pairs of actions, uh, then triplets of actions or quadruplet of actions. And you will see that some of these uh, pairs of triplet or quadruplets, they always fail. Um, so this is an approach that also works for any type of problem because it doesn't depend really on the on the problem. It, it, you just need to have a set of actions and you, you can choose subset of action with this, within this, this plan. So that's a generic. So I would say that the generic, the geometric reasoner is quite generic as it is now. Um, how hard is it to construct the configuration space in practice? Uh, but that's hard. <laughs> you never construct it. I mean, that's why we that's why we sample it. Uh, we sample it, and usually you you also use um, heuristics to to sample a bit more uh, the parts which seems to be difficult. Um, so in order to to save time, you don't want to sample it completely uniformly. You try to to guide a bit your sampling. But you, 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 can, you can never have a full, uh, 
you, you can never construct it completely. I mean, here we are talking about uh, dimensions. So in the case of, of a robot, like, uh, like Justin here, you have, I think, seven degrees of freedom for each arm. Um, and if you are solving problem with three or four robots playing together, then you have a 40, 50 degrees of freedom. So it's a huge space to, to sample. Um, does geometric backtracking requ require a full horizon plan? Um, so what, what do you mean? Uh, well, you, 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 so here, I'm, Malik, can you help me on that one? What does it mean here? Can, can you do, can you do uh, your backtracking on partial plans that, uh, that do not reach the goal? Can you do a receding horizon? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, yes, that's what uh, that's what we actually do. We start. I mean, there are different implementation. I mean, I, I've tried different planners here, but usually, yes, you 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 make a symbolic action. You try to instantiate it, and you start doing backtracking right from the first action. Uh, has there been any benchmarking of temp algorithms? <laughs> So yeah, I know. Uh, we have tried uh, with uh, with people from uh, with other authors, uh, uh, Garrett, uh, Akbari. I mean, if we were uh, the Neil Dantam and a couple of other uh, Miss Kavlaki, we, we we have tried to we have built we have uh, put online uh, a wiki. Uh, where we try to, we have proposed five problems uh, which are meant to, to, to cover, um, which are meant to be representative of what is a difficult task and motion planning problem. And I don't know if people are using it or not. I don't think so. I, I've been asked permission to access the wiki. Uh, so I think people are interested in it, but I haven't seen any papers really using them. I, some people ask me question, how do you do on that problem and so on? But it seems maybe it's, it's a bit complicated to, to... What people do is that they, they use their own... I mean, they start working on task and motion planning and, and they use their own um, systems. And, and I think it's always a bit painful to, to comply to... Uh, certain formats or certain constraints so i guess that's why it's not kicking in right now maybe someday it will <laughs> i can give the i think in the bibliography i give um, if you are interested here there is the the link of this uh, wiki sorry there is the list of this wiki and uh, it's private but you, you can just ask uh, if you want to look what is inside. Um, I'm a bit lost. Uh, backtracking. Uh, not allowed to unmute. Ah, okay. Let's look at the uh, last one. Uh, I would just type my audio is not going in. Okay. In the whole task of grabbing bottle and putting it in the box. Is it possible to think of it as a hierarchical task planning, disintegrate, sorry, disintegrate it somehow? From your representation, it didn't cap I didn't capture it if you already mentioned. Um, so I'm not sure what disintegrate means here. Uh, Well, what I can say here is that I actually hierarchical task planning is something that I tried in the very beginning of my of my PhD when I was working on the on, on the project because we thought um, we thought that well um, this manipulation task they have a they have a hierarchical structure in them and it's it seems very natural to to design to define methods for for manipulating objects so you could say okay when when i want to move an object from from a location to another there is not thousands of ways to do that whether you pick and place it whether you pick 
regrasp and place it, or you pick, place it to an intermediate pose and pick and place it with the other arm. You say, oh, and you, you have multiple combination of this using left and right arms. <clears throat> so we thought that we can, that we can somehow cover all the possible uh, manipulation uh, sequences with a couple of uh, HTN methods. Uh, but uh, in practice, it turned out that it's, uh, it's really not the case. Um, because sometimes, uh, for instance, you in, in some problems, you, you, you need to, yeah, you need to pick an object. But uh, then what you want to do is to simply lift your arm and keep that object in the air and with the other arm do something else and then put the object back, for instance. And well, unfortunately, this is not in your method. So you add it in your method. You add a new method just to do that. And then you will face another problem where uh, you say, I, I don't remember because I did that a long time ago, but what I realized is that many problems, I couldn't find a solution because there was a, a method missing. So I was ending up adding new methods for each new cases. And in my experience, uh, it's very difficult to, to cover, uh, to have all the methods to solve all the problems. And that's why uh, we moved on to uh, state space planning because here uh, you are basically free <laughs> of applying any, of creating any sequence of action. I don't know if that answers the question. Ah, okay. All right. Thank you very much, Fabien, for this uh, nice presentation that was quite comprehensive on three main uh, approaches to the combination of, uh, of integration of task and, uh, and motion planning. I believe you 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 explained very well uh, these uh, three approaches. The one that takes uh, a task planner as a heuristic to guide motion planning, and the one that does the opposite. And the third approach that basically constrained propagation with uh, geometric reasoning. Yeah. And uh, these are certainly the uh, uh, three very important approaches. Let me just mention that, uh, that there are a few approaches that have been explored, such as, uh, such as uh, backward chaining from, yeah. from the gold bag yeah. that you are certainly aware of. But you, you of course, uh, in one hour, you could not cover everything. Maybe a pointer to the uh, students uh, on that. There have been several papers about uh, this goal regression uh, technique that can take into account some form of uncertainty. And uh, there are a couple other approaches, such as compiling the combined task and motion planning into a classical planning problem that yeah. have been tried on, on some uh, ca cases. So it's a, certainly a very rich area and uh, um, you are um, uh, invited to, to, to go to the uh, Slack channel for this lecture of Fabia and ask uh, additional questions and take into account also the references that Fabia uh, will uh, give you in his slides. Thank you again. So- Thank you. Uh, Michael, would you like to add something else? Yeah, so I believe the next session uh, today is in 45 minutes. And uh, I will see you all there. Okay. That's all. Thank you. See you in a moment. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.